lecture is for Chapter 2 of Building Java Programs. These slides are, again, from my good friend, Amelia Gahn. And we're going to be talking mostly about for loops. And I've got a lot of slides to cover. And so I'm going to go through these pretty fast. Uh, you, you take advantage of Penopto's ability to uh, go through by slides. So skip over the ones that aren't important to you. So first, we're going to talk about basic data types. And the way I think of this, actually, is types that came from C which are the primitive data types, and then everything else which has been added by Java. That's why there, we have these primitive data types, because people didn't want to have to rewrite all the code that they had already written in C. So if these basic data types, int, double, care, bool, these are the most common ones. If you have special needs, you can use these. The reason we have different data types is because for efficiency reasons, we don't want to store everything as big as possible. We want to store them as small as possible. Uh, I wanted to give you an industry minute about primitive types. So believe it or not, Microsoft Word, the program that everybody uses to create their documents, contains basically no floating point numbers at all. Um, even though we have to figure out where to place things with very great precision on the screen, we use what are called TWIPs, which are 144th of an inch. And that's because we didn't want to use the expense of using floating point numbers. Now, Word was designed a long time ago, and so um, maybe today, you would, if you were to do it, you would use floating point. But ints are so much faster and smaller that if it's possible to use ints, you should use ints. Another thing that's hard to believe is Microsoft Excel. That wonderful spreadsheet, believe it or not, outside of the actual numbers being computed in the spreadsheet, we use no floats, basically. And even inside the spreadsheet to store the numbers, we don't use floats either, or doubles. We, we use something much higher precision than that, because you don't want rounding errors in Excel, right? You, you need to have the exact accurate numbers. So great pains have been taken. But yeah, believe it or not, we don't use floating point in, in most of the Office uh, um, applications. OK, expressions. So expressions are just a bunch of, of numbers or variables put together that create some value, and we use expressions all over the place. If you've ever taken a compiler course, you'll really understand why we call things expressions and why it's important. Uh, operands and operators, these are all probably familiar to you, except maybe mod. Mod is basically the remainder. If, you, if we just call it remainder, I think everybody knows what that is. Literals are just hard-coded numbers or strings instead of the variables. We often put literals into variables. And here's talking about strings, booleans, true and false. You don't know how boolean is implemented. It could be uh, implemented as, as little as a bit. Integer division is really rounded division. Um, you know, for most applications, you don't have to worry about this kind of thing. But if you are using numbers, it's very important to understand how integers and doubles um, intermix. I think we're getting to that next. OK, first we're going to talk about mod. Mod is just the remainder. If you need to get the ones digit of a variable, you can use mod 10. Or if you want to get the tens digit, you could use, uh, you can divide by 10 to drop out that last one, and then mod it by 10. Don't be dividing by 10 or trying to take the remainder after 10. It's going to throw an error. OK, precedence is important. Um, precedence is mostly intuitive. You've all learned in, in math that the higher precedence, um, multiplication, division, always take precedence over addition. And Amelia points out that even when parens aren't necessary, you should do it. I totally agree. OK, now we start getting to the interesting stuff. So when you do integer division, it just truncates. When you do, um, when you have two operands, one of which is a double, the other is an int, this all becomes double math. If you don't want that to be double math, you can always cast something to, to be an int by just putting paren and then the type in front of it. 
So variables, I think you've probably learned all about variables in, in 110. What I wanted to point out is, again, um, some knowledge from the compiler world. Whenever you create a variable, um, it's generally very inexpensive to create a local variable like this. What happens when you declare a local variable like this is there's something called a stack, and we just increment a, a, a counter to indicate how much stack space that we need for these simple variables. But remember earlier when we were talking about um, nested loops? Well, actually, let's, let's get, wait till we get to the nested loops later. So whenever you create a variable, it's got to create some memory somewhere. Generally, it's a very inexpensive operation to do it when you declare it like this. Here's a form for declaring variables, and we can also assign values to those variables. You only want to declare your variable once. This is kind of a silly example, but if later you tried to use x and declared it int, that would be an error. Here we talk about combining, declaring, and assigning. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Um, this is kind of a strange but useful format if you have a bunch of variables that you all want to assign the same thing. It actually works from right to left. So it calculates this, and then it starts assigning it going that way. String concatenation, we talked a little bit about this last week. So there is precedence in string concatenation, so you're always looking to see are there multiplicative or division uh, <coughs> operators. So that's going to go first, and then you're going to work from left to right on everything else that's equal. So then it's going to add the two and the three, and then it's going to combine it with the hello, which is going to make a string five hello, and then it's going to add these as strings. So not real common occurrences. OK, increment and decrement are very, very useful. These um, were thrown into C. They were introduced in C because C is so much like assembly language. They basically took assembly language, and then they figured out what operators they needed to implement assembly language. And this is an incredibly um, useful thing. And so it's, it's a built-in assembly language instruction. So they've created this plus equals and plus plus um, to, do, to do that for you. Here's the plus, plus, and minus, minus, before and after. So these, you get the value. If you're using it of the value um, of this expression, you get the value first, and then it'll increment it later. Um, just sitting right here, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But when you actually, let's start the next slide. Yeah, here we go. So we're taking the value. So in this case, you need to increment x before you get the value out of it. And here, you're going to get the value of y before you, it, you decrement it. And again, these are extremely useful operators. Here, this is just showing that Java can combine different types, and it'll, 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 it'll make what it needs to, to, to do in order to fit things in. This is the only one that's illegal, because you can't stick a floating point into an integer. OK, this is really what I've been rushing through this to get to. This is the important part, for loops. So for for loops, you know, you've already seen this type of thing in CSC 110. It's just uh, you need to get the syntax down. So first of all, you can declare your loop variables inside the loop here. And generally, there's two ways you're going to do the loops. You can either do it from 1 less than equal to the end. And this is kind of what most people think of, counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or you could do a 0 and then just have less than the number. It would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You would generally do that if you're using an array or you're doing something that is 0 indexed for some other reason. So this part in the middle here is the condition. The loop will execute. It'll, it'll, it'll evaluate every single time. So after this is assigned, then it'll immediately evaluate, is i less than or equal to 5? So if this isn't true, this, this line will never be executed. Otherwise, it'll go ahead and execute the line, and then afterwards, it will do whatever is here, an increment. And then after it's incremented, it's going to go back here to check the conditional again. Here it's just going over what I just said. 
you know, flow charts like this, people don't really use anymore. I mean, it, it's good so that you can see something formalized like this, but most programmers don't do anything so uh, formal as this. This is showing a couple of common patterns. We talked about how you can do the zero and then less than the number. The most common type is to do one less than or equal to the number. Sometimes you want to decrement. Um, in, if you were doing these loops in C, you would almost always want to actually decrement. The reason why is because if this here is complex, then C, potentially depending on how smart your compiler is, actually will evaluate that that uh, expression every single time. Um, and so it's more efficient to actually pre-compute it if you can and then just decrement down through it. Nested loops. Okay, this is another important topic for this week and it's a great example because everybody does it this way. They have like I as the outer loop and J as the inner loop. I would never do that. It always leads to confusion. Okay, so in this case I from one to three and J from one to three is like, huh? Well, which was which, which which one is which? So that's why I would never use I here. I would say the row. Okay, so the row is this first one because we can see I is being printed first. So this is the row one. The row two, two, two. The row three, three, three. So I would say for for int row equals one, row less than or equal to three, row plus plus for call equals one, for call less than or equal to three, call plus plus, then I would print the row dot call, okay? So always use an intelligent variable. But nested loops, you've got the outer loop, which is going to be executing more slowly than the inner loop. The inner loop is always going to be spinning faster. You can have a third loop in here. It's going to be spinning even faster because it's going to be executed every time, and then this will be ha happen every every time the inner, mo innermost loop executes, and then this will be executed every time the two innermost loops would be executed. Here, this just goes over that. I also wanted to point out that the book specifically points out that using the wrong loop variable is a very common error. Well, it's a very common error because most books just tell people to use I and J. <laughs> If you're going to use I and J, you're going to get very easily confused. So if you used row and column, you would never, almost never make a mistake. So this slide is talking about where you should define your variables. So in theory, you want to define your variables in the smallest scope possible. It provides um, less chance that you're going to accidentally access a variable uh, where, you're, where you don't want to access it. Um, I don't particularly like her example here. She's got this loop from one to five, and then she's declaring a local variable here and then printing it. <laughs> okay, it's a silly, silly use, but what I would say is what's much, much more common. Oh, yeah, here we go. So you've got, you're trying to access, well, actually, generally what's happening is you're trying to access this loop variable. Suppose you're running through this, and then you want to do something with showing how far you got through the loop. It generally happens with an indefinite loop. Then you'll try to access the variable here. You can't access it here if it's declared up here. Uh, the earliest versions of C, you could, you could not actually define anything here. It had, all had to be de declared up here. Later versions of C, you can do this. Uh, the other thing about efficiency is that it's not clear what the compiler is doing here. A compiler could actually be um, allocating stack for this variable every time it comes into this. Suppose you've got 10 loops in here, each loop having a local variable defined here inside the loop, it could actually be pushing stack every single time. Um, it's going to be less efficient than having one declaration out here. But it is safer to do it this way. So generally, you should do it this way, but it's all, not always going to work for you if you need to access, generally, your loop variable outside of the loop. So here, she's just declared the loop variable outside. Now you can access the loop to see how far it got. Okay, this is yet another argument for why you're not shouldn't be using IJK. So this guy's actually used the same exact variable for the outer and the inner loop. That ain't gonna work very well. <laughs> Don't be doing that. You know, again, you won't have these problems if you use intelligently named loop variables. 
And of course, if you do it wrong, the loop may never terminate. So pseudocode is something that programmers do all the time, although not at this level of detail. We do what's called whiteboarding. Whenever we talk with our fellow programmers, we will grab a whiteboard and we'll draw some big, big descriptions of the kind of modules that we're going to do. We, we aren't going to do pseudocode for each for loop. But for you, I, I think it's a good way to start. So you want to break up the problem into some simple explanations of what each thing is going to do. OK, this actually gets into a topic I'm going to make a whole separate video about for the Space Needle problem. So we're just going to skip over this. And that is the end of our chapter. So in addition to this one, when you do the, home, the Space Needle homework, I want you to go look at my separate video. I try to keep these videos to under 20 minutes. I just think more than that, and you're going to go to sleep on me. So um, yeah, take a look at that video when you do the homework, and I think it'll be really helpful. Good luck.